Now comes the hard part, <laughs> which is talking. This all started a very long time ago. It was around 1982. I was uh, nine or 10 years old. And from a very early age, I knew that I constantly was drumming on the table with my fingers or with a pair of pencils or a pair of rulers if they were laying around. And I remember that when my family and I lived in Fairless Hills in Bucks County, there was a couch in the TV room, not unlike everybody, everybody's place. Uh, but to me, it was a lot more than that because I knew that if you arrange the pillows along the lower piece and you got your rulers out of the drawer, then that became a drum kit for me. And I didn't even really know what I was doing at that young age. But what I did know is that in my mind, I could be in a rock and roll band and that it was awesome. Uh, fortunately for me, I had and still have a brother-in-law who is an excellent musician in his own right and can play guitar, can play keyboards, he can sing, but first he was a drummer. So he saw what I was up to and, you know, destroying my mom's furniture, and he showed me how to hold the sticks the right way, he taught me how to read music, uh, he taught me all the rudiments, which are uh, sticking combinations. In, in grammar, you could think of them like words, and if you string rudiments together, you can make a sentence, for lack of a better metaphor. And the next year, when I was 11, I got my first uh, drum kit, which was uh, not that one, but another Blue Ludwig kit uh, that my mom had bought secondhand uh, from a store in um, Willow Grove, and I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. And to me, playing music and, and drumming has always been a source of comfort, a source of happiness, uh, a source of a sense of achievement. And it's been the longest relationship I've ever had. It's never let me down. It's never, it doesn't not call you back, okay? It doesn't not return your emails, that kind of thing. But we are celebrating our 32nd anniversary together uh, already, which is pretty hard to believe. So one of the first takeaways that I would like you to have from this is that labels are for other people. They're not for you. Now, when you're younger, you're going to meet people as you go throughout your life. And when you're a kid, usually the first thing that someone else will ask you is for some kind of context, okay? A contextual identifier, what, kind of, what school you go to, what sports teams you root for, what neighborhood you live in, so that that other person knows what to do with you in the conversation, for the most part. But you're, you're not a kid forever, so eventually you become an adult and you go into the workforce and the same thing occurs when you meet people. Uh, you meet people at networking events or in your neighborhood or in your place of worship, and it's the same dance. Somebody will put their hand out, they'll say, nice to meet you, Brian. What do you do for a living? It's a dangerous question. Um, you know there is some kind of anarchistic streak in you, I hope we all have that, um, that really just wants to say that I'm a transplant from Indiana, I still enjoy Motley Crue, and I like a big vodka on the rocks, if possible. But you're at a work event, so you can't do that. And you fall into the trap, and I think it is kind of a trap, where you fall back into the safe thing and you say, well, I am an accountant at ABC Company, or I'm a construction manager at Acme building or, or, or whatever it is. So it's very easy to fall into that trap. And if you do it over and over and over enough times, you will start to let that label identify you. But again, labels are for other people's use, not for your own. 
So, moving forward, the next takeaway we want to talk about is that sometimes you're going to find yourself in a place that maybe you don't recognize. Uh, the world is abrupt. It can be difficult. It can be inconsistent. It can be messy. And with all the noise that goes on in day-to-day -day life, some, you find yourself driving down a road that eventually you won't recognize. And if you've got a strong creative streak or artistic streak, or if you have a hobby that really makes you tick, you may wander pretty far away from where you really wanted to be. So when you find yourself in one of those situations, and it probably, and I hope it doesn't happen, I hope everyone is fully engaged and actualized, and, and during the day you're doing what makes you tick. Now, if not, then you have to realize where you are. You're on a road not of, maybe not of your conscious choosing. So when you get to that point, the thing you need to do is imagine you're on a road. If you don't want to keep going straight, you need to grab the wheel, you hit the gas, and you turn hard to the left. And you go off in that direction where you really wanted to go. You don't know what's going to be over there. You're not going to be able to see around the bend or over the hill. But you're going to enjoy the ride, I assure you. And when you get to where you want to go, you're going to find some pretty good stuff that we'll talk about in a minute. The trick with this all is that it's very easy when you're on this road and you find yourself in a place not of your choosing. It's very easy to think that the, it's the world against you or, the wor or you against the world. It's circumstance, it's other forces. Um, but quite honestly, the stress that you feel in that situation, it is you versus yourself. It has nothing to do with the outside world. It is all internal. And that's a great day when you realize that. Because when you do realize that, you put yourself back in control of your own professional destiny. And once you realize that, you can do something about it. So in my case, that meant bringing this whole thing into my professional world. And it took a lot of questioning and wondering what I was up to with some of my, some of the people that you'd run into uh, contact with every day. And that's okay, because I think the, f the first thing that people feel in the work world is that, well, if people don't understand me, maybe I'm, maybe I'm weird, or I won't fit in, or I won't get ahead, or I won't succeed. It's actually exactly the opposite. Your weirdness and your uniqueness are not a weakness. They're actually a strength. And once you learn to cultivate your strength and ignore your weaknesses, that's when you're going to get to where you want to go. So for me, that meant pursuing the creative side of my life as hard as I possibly could. That meant going on auditions, uh, returning to a daily practice routine, which we all have responsibilities and jobs, and maybe we have family obligations, and. And, and baseball games to go to and PTA meetings, you have to carve out time to make sure that you can cultivate your strength. And some interesting things started to happen as a result of that, and they were all totally unexpected. First, on the creative side, I had fallen in with a really good group of musicians, uh, much better than, vastly better than me. I was hanging on by my fingernails the whole time. And we started gigging out locally in the valley here. That went well. We decided to make a record. The record turned out vastly better than we had hoped. We started to play gigs in New York City, which for a jazz group like the one I'm in, Manhattan is the center of the universe. That's really where you want to be. Manhattan or, you know, in Paris, in Europe, or, or, or in Rome or someplace. So for us, you know, this little group from the Lehigh Valley to get up there and make that leap was the result of making a conscious choice back here a couple of years ago 
to bring the creative piece into my professional world, be more open about it, and cultivate it. The New York gigs went so well that we got a residency up there and we're at a club in Midtown Manhattan every month, which for a group outside of town is, is highly unusual. The record we submitted for consideration for the 2015 Grammys. It has cleared the first hurdle and will appear in the preliminary ballots, which come out on October 15th. Now, why do I mention all of this stuff? Not one thing in that chain of events would have happened if I had stayed on the road and did what I think other people had expected. All of this success that happened over here on the creative side really made me think, how could I leverage this into my professional day job world, into my professional mind? And I found that I started to look and I started speaking to other musicians and recording studios, and they introduced me to filmmakers and to actors and to modeling agencies. And I learned that everyone was seeking legal representation in New York City or in Philadelphia. Not one person I spoke to had an attorney in the region. And that was the birth of an entertainment law practice. And the amazing thing about that is that the client base was right here, right under my nose the entire time. I just wasn't looking for it. None of that would have happened if I hadn't embraced my passion and started to cultivate my, one of my strengths, which is the, that stuff you just heard a little while ago. The other interesting outcome from embracing my passion was that I started to meet other like-minded people that I had no idea were, had other sides to their life. And a couple of people are in the room that I've had this conversation with. And uh, a couple years ago, one time I was setting up the drums actually in this building up on the third floor. And I'm doing my thing and, and putting the cymbals on the stands and making sure everything's where it's supposed to be. And I look in the back of the room and I see a guy who I think, who I think I know. And I think, boy, that looks just like Mr. X. Now, Mr. X is uh, a very successful commercial real estate broker. And we had done deals together, but it was, you know, it was at arm's length. Mr. X, pleased to meet you. We're going to sit down and we'll do all the paperwork. And, and everything was very, you know, very gentlemanly and, and all of that, but it was, it was not the way I'm about to describe it. So as I'm setting up, I see back there somebody who looks like Mr. X, and he's got a, 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 a Hawaiian shirt on, I believe, and camera gear, like, strapped all over all over him. And I'm like, well, I, I don't think that's him. Maybe he's a brother or somebody that, you know, doppelganger running around. Who knows? Um, and I go back to completing the, the setup, and I turn around again, and Mr. X is right here. And we had that moment of recognition where we both pointed at each other and said, what are you doing here? Because he didn't know I was a drummer. I didn't know he was a photographer that has traveled the world and has exhibited uh, all over the region and has a serious photography uh, career totally independent of what he does. So there's a lot of people like us out there, I think. And I think that if you can embrace your passion, make it part of your professional life, you're going to be a lot happier, you're going to be a lot more effective. Your company is going to benefit, I think, because if they've got more people that are more energized and more engaged, then you've got something. So in closing, I want to say that I think that if you were of two minds, once you can channel them into a single stream, you can become a force and you can create your own professional reality and other people will, will embrace it. Thanks for listening. Go be excellent. Take care. <laughs>